Greetings everyone in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome uh, to this uh, service from Atherton Uniting Church. My name is Pastor Chris Guys. I'm a chaplain with uh, Frontier Services and I'm going to be joined uh, today by my colleagues, Reverend uh, Johnson McCoddy, who will be bringing prayers and also by Reverend Russell Clark, who's going to be bringing us the uh, sermon this morning. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, please sit back, relax, grab your Bibles uh, and engage with the material that we have here this morning um, and uh, hopefully that you will be uplifted and uh, the Lord will um, gift you with grace. So let me welcome Reverend Johnson up to the pulpit and he's going to bring us our prayer of prayers. Thank you. Morning to everyone. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the life you have given us. We just want to thank you Amen. that you are God who is always with us. We thank you that in the midst of this coronavirus, we still worship you and we still praise you and thank you for who you are. Father, we just want to thank you that you give the wisdom to all the national leaders to guide their people and help their people to understand uh, who God is. And also we pray for the doctors and the nurses who are looking after these people who are on the front line. Father, we pray that some of them are part of our family members and we just pray that you continue to help us and guide us and uh, continue to give us the hope that there is nothing impossible. Lord Jesus Christ, can the dry bones be put back to become the real body? I know you can because you are God and because we believe in you. Nothing is impossible with you. You can stop this coronavirus. You can bring down the fears in every one of us. And Father, we just want to say, for everyone who thinks there is no hope, we believe that there is God who can bring life back its normality. You can bring hold to all this, what is happening in the world. The world is in a panic, but God, you are not in a panic. You have created everything in your image, and you know when it is time to stop it. Thank you, Father. Thank you for everything. Thank you for just helping us to be able to go on and move on and bring hope to the hopeless world. In your name I pray. Amen. Everyone, our Bible reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 11, verse 17 to 44. I will call Pastor Chris to come and read uh, the Word of God. Thank, Thank you, you, Johnson. I'm going to be reading today uh, from the New Testament passage, John 11, 17 to 44. As Johnson said, I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation, which is a particular favourite of mine. Um, but follow along with me with any translation that you have. Beginning in verse 17. Now, when they arrived at Bethany, which was only about two miles from Jerusalem, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Many friends of Mary and Martha had come from the region to console them over the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was approaching the village, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Mary said to Jesus, My Lord, if only you had come sooner, my brother wouldn't have died. But now I know that if you were to ask God for anything, he would do it for you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise and live. She replied, Yes, I know he will rise with everyone else on Resurrection Day. Martha, Jesus said, You don't have to wait until then. I am the resurrection and I am life eternal. Anyone who clings to me in faith, even though he dies, will live forever. And the one who lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Then Martha replied, Yes, Lord, I do. I've always believed that you are the anointed one, the son of God who has come into the world for us. Then she left and hurried off to her sister Mary and called her aside from all the mourners and whispered to her, the master is here and he's asking for you. So when Mary heard this, she quickly went off to find him. For Jesus was lingering outside the village of the same spot where Mary met him. Now when Mary's friends who were comforting her noticed how quickly she ran out of the house, they followed her, assuming she was going to the tomb of her brother to mourn. When Mary found Jesus outside the village and fell at his feet, 
in tears and she said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus looked at Mary and saw her weeping at his feet, and all her friends were with her grieving, he shuddered with emotion and was deeply moved with tenderness and compassion. He said to them, Where did you bury him? Lord, come with us and we will show you, they replied. Then tears streamed down Jesus' face. Seeing Jesus weep caused many of the mourners to say, Look how much he loved Lazarus. Yet others said, Isn't this the one who opens blind eyes? Why didn't he do something to keep Lazarus from dying? Then Jesus, with intense emotions, came to the tomb, a cave with a stone placed over its entrance. Jesus told them, Roll away the stone. Then Martha said, But Lord, it's been four days since he died. By now his body is already decomposing. Jesus looked at her and said, Didn't I tell you that if you will believe in me, you will see God unveil his power? So they rolled away the heavy stone. Jesus gazed into heaven and said, Father, thank you that you have heard my prayer, for you listen to every word I speak. Now, so that these who stand here with me will believe that you have sent me to the earth as your messenger, I will use the power you have given me. Then with a loud voice, Jesus shouted with authority, Lazarus, come out of the tomb. Then in front of everyone, Lazarus, who had died four days earlier, slowly hobbled out. He still had grave clothes tightly wrapped around his hands and feet and covering his face. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him loose. This is the word of the Lord. Let me now welcome uh, Reverend Russell Clark to the podium to bring us this morning's sermon. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, Chris and Johnson. There's a bird on Cape York called the Superb Fruit Dove. It's a beautiful bird. It's clothed in white, green and orange. And the male is particularly attractive because the male has a purple crown, not like mine, a purple crown, which is very distinctive. And so this bird is very radiant in these colours. When I was principal at Bamiger, I was walking around the school one day and I came across one of these birds. It had flown into the window and its neck was broken. It lay there on the ground. I picked it up, it was dead, but it was still warm. And I admired the beauty of this bird. And then I thought about it, I thought, what do I do with this beautiful creature? And I came to the conclusion the only thing I could do was throw it in the rubbish bin because it was not worth anything anymore. And yet a few minutes ago, it had been flying around full of life with, with intent and with purpose. And now in my hands, it was just something to be disposed of. I often think about that what is life? What is this mystery that energises us, that enables us to breathe, enables us to interact with other people, to play, to love and appreciate what God has created around us? But the other side of life is death. Recently, the last African white rhinoceros died in captivity. A species gone forever. And that seems to be the nature of death. Apparently it's irreversible. Once something dies, that's it. And when people die, when people die, pass on, we're left with many and varied emotions. And quite often, as we read this passage about Lazarus, we know the story, but I just want to hone in on a couple of passages, a couple of phrases. And the first one is, if only. If only. If only is a phrase that expresses regret. I have two brothers who've passed on. And there are times when I uh, have an experience that I want to share with them and they're not there. And I thought, if only they were here, I could share that. I have two parents who've died. And there are often times when I want some information about their life. And I think, if only they were here, or if only I had asked them. If only 
is a, is a verse that expresses extreme regret at things we may have failed to say, may have failed to do, and at the fact that we didn't spend enough time with the person who's passed on. Amen. Martha and Larry love Lazarus, and they're shattered with grief. But they are particularly disappointed with Jesus because he wasn't there. Maybe if Jesus was there, he could have done something. <laughs> so when Jesus arrives, it's interesting that both Martha and Mary challenge Jesus. They challenge him with the same thing. If only, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. What amazing faith they have because they believe that Jesus could have done something. What amazing faith Martha has when she says, but even now, I know that God will give you what you ask. Their grief is great, but their faith in Jesus is rock solid. If only. Another phrase that comes to my mind is the resurrection and the life. Because Jesus makes this amazing response to Martha. He points to himself and says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, and though, even though he dies, and he who believes in me shall never die. We hear those words at funerals, but we don't hear the, word that, the sentence that comes after us because he adds these challenging words to Martha and says, Do you believe this? Do you believe this? That's a challenge not only to Martha and to Mary, but it's a challenge to us. Do we believe that there is life beyond death? Do we believe that death is not final? That death does not have the last say? Jesus claimed that those who believed in him will never die. Do you believe that? Do you believe that it's possible for someone who's died to come back to life again? In the Bible we read that Elijah brought a widow's son back to life. In the book of Ezekiel we find Ezekiel has this incredible vision of dry bones and when he prophesies to these bones as God has directed him all of a sudden the bones rattle and move and, and they come together and sinew is added and blood and, and muscle and so we have bodies yes. but then he breathes life into them Amen. and they come alive Jesus raised a dead son to life Jesus spoke to Jairus' daughter and brought her back to life. Jesus challenges us with the question, do you believe? Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life? Amen. Can I say some people don't? <laughs> they don't believe. They, can, they say, how can you get something that is inanimate and make it alive? That's impossible. But it's not impossible. Everybody believes that. Because everybody believes at some stage in the history of this planet there was no life on it. And now there is. How do you come to that? And scientists will make up stories or atheists will make up stories. And those stories are just as imaginable to them as us saying God breathed life into this planet, into the people. Some people say you can't bring something that's not alive back to life. And yet it's something that we all believe at some stage or another. Do you believe this? Jesus says. Do we believe that he is the source of life and the giver of life? Do we believe that Jesus is the one who offers eternal life? That's the challenge of the Easter story. If only I'm the resurrection... Do you believe? And the next verse, the paraphrase that I want to bring to you is deeply moved. Funerals are very, very highly emotional at times. They're times of great grief, times of great um, shock, of feeling alone, even of feeling anger. The emotions run deep when we lose someone that has passed away. And people, it says, had come to comfort Martha and Mary. No doubt there was a lot of wailing and there was a lot of tears. And Jesus somehow seems to be caught up in the emotion. John's Gospel says that Jesus wept. And twice it says that Jesus was deeply moved. 
moved in spirit and trouble. Jesus loved Lazarus. But wait a minute. Why would he be troubled? <laughs> if he knew that Lazarus was going to come back to life, why would he be troubled? Even when he is away and Lazarus has died, he informs his disciples that Lazarus had died, but he says he will bring him back to life. He knew that before he even arrived at the funeral scene. If Jesus knew that this would happen, why would he be troubled? Why would he be upset? Why would he be deeply moved? Can I suggest three things? First of all, I think he is moved because he dared to love. And love is a vulnerable thing. It's a vulnerable emotion because when we dare to love, we dare to be hurt. Dinesh D'Souza speaks of uh, reading about a friend of his who he went to school with and he hadn't seen him for 20 years. And the friend had written an email to advise him that his son had died. And D'Souza said he cried, he found himself crying and he didn't even know this lad who died. He hadn't seen this friend for 20 years. Why did he cry? Because something in the hurt of someone else moves us to tears. And when we love someone deeply, we are moved deeply. Jesus sees what has happened and the impact of Lazarus's death has on Martha and Mary and he is moved to tears. Jesus shares with us in our grief. Jesus was God who dared to be human. He shares with our suffering. He walks with us in our pain. He's there all the time. And I believe that Jesus wept because he dared to love. And when we dare to love, we dare to grieve too. But there's another reason I believe. I believe that Jesus was angry. He was deeply angry. In the New Living Translation it says he was angry. And that is the word, the Greek equivalent, or one of the Greek expressions that is used here. What was he angry about? Was he angry because he saw the destruction that Satan had done to this planet? Was he angry because he saw what original sin had done? Was he angry because he knew that there were consequences of our actions? I believe he was upset because he saw the destruction that death had brought. I believe he was upset because he saw what Satan had done to this human race. I believe he was upset because he saw the effects of sin, how it is damaging and hurting and destructive. I believe he's upset because he realises that death is a part of something greater than death. Death is part of something that is greater than we understand. Death is the part of the action of Satan on our lives. Death is a part of something that is destructive and evil. And I believe Jesus is moved. People often blame God for their misfortunes. But maybe we should be directing the blame to somewhere else. It's true source. Or maybe there could be a third reason for Jesus feeling the way he did. Jesus knew his time on earth was short. He knew time was running out. He knew that he too would go through the same pain in a similar way to what Lazarus had done. He was under no illusion of what lay ahead of him. He knew what was there. He didn't face it with a great deal of pleasure or joy, but he knew that it was a necessary act for salvation to come. No one else could take those steps that Jesus said. No one. And so I believe that Jesus was deeply moved because he loves us. He was deeply moved because he's seen what sin has done to us. And he was deeply moved because he knew that he would go through his own time. Do you believe this? This Jesus, God made human, shares your tears. This Jesus, God made human, understands your pain. This Jesus knows your suffering. This Jesus walks beside you. This Jesus is angry at what destruction Satan has wrecked in your life. This Jesus is the one who died for you. He is the one who is the resurrection and the life. He is the one who offers you eternal life. The question is, do you believe this? So what was the result? I just want to finish by saying the last passage I want to share with you is many put their faith in him. 
but some of them. Some of them. Jesus became alive again. A miracle had occurred, and when Jesus ordered the tomb to be open, people tried to dissuade him. They did not believe things this could happen. They could not appreciate the wonderful miracle that would follow. But the miracle followed. The impossible became possible. God breathed life into Lazarus. Ezekiel saw dry bones coming together, sinew, muscle, skin, blood and life. The people witnessed Lazarus coming out of the tomb, life coming from death. So what was the result of the people who saw this? It says, many put their faith in him. Many put their faith in him. It's interesting that the miracles of Jesus were an avenue of people to put their faith in him. Whether it was healing, whether it was bringing someone back to life, whether it was feeding 5,000 people, whatever. But there's another passage there that says, but some went off to the Pharisees and they told the Pharisees about it. And that was the start of the plot to kill him. You see, some people are not convinced by any miracle. Some people are not convinced by Jesus. They already have a predetermined view. And whatever Jesus does, it only concretes that predetermined view. And out of this miracle came a process and a plan to have him killed. Some of you believe, and some don't. And for people who do not believe in Jesus, the best thing they can do was to get rid of him. It's interesting that you, there is a group of militant atheists today who want to get rid of Jesus. They want to get rid of God. They want God out of the equation. If I didn't believe in God, I wouldn't be upset if somebody else did. <laughs> but there's something about Jesus that stirs the emotions in people. And some people find that they find their glory in him and other people it just embeds their evil hatred of him. There will be some who will stare at the miracle of Jesus and not be moved. But one day, the scriptures say, one day every knee will bow and declare Jesus as their Lord. I pray that people will believe that Jesus is their Lord before they come to a time where they are forced to bend the knee and proclaim what they never believed. And I pray that God will use you and me as part of his plan to bring that about. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for this familiar story, but Lord, it is a prelude to your story. You went to the cross, you suffered death, but like Lazarus, the tomb could not hold you. You came out. And so, Lord, as we come towards the Easter season, we celebrate this, and we thank you that your love for us sent you to the cross, but your love for us brought us beyond the cross to a resurrected life. So death has no sin. And those of us who believe will know that glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen. If you would like some prayer, or you would like to contact our Minister Johnson for any needs, please contact him on 0407 474 758. And please continue to keep each other in prayer at this time. It's very important that we stay together as a family. I'm now going to pass over to Chris Guys, Pastor Chris Guys, and he will talk to you. Thank you, Russell, for that wonderful sermon, uh, preaching on the resurrection and uh, the life of Jesus that we have through the resurrection. Um, I just want to finish off by uh, thanking um, Russell and, uh, and Johnson and also our behind the scenes operator, Ben, who's uh, producing this video. Uh, thanks, guys, for coming on. And uh, I just want to conclude by saying, if you have enjoyed this video and if you're enjoying connecting with us in this means, and I hope you all are, this is a great tool for us to, to be together and connect with one another during this pandemic crisis. Uh, please feel free to subscribe. It's in the bottom, bottom of your screen somewhere. There should be a subscribe button. If you subscribe to this YouTube channel, then you will be able to receive immediate notification and updates whenever we post content. 
So uh, I invite you to do that and uh, we look forward to speaking to you soon. Bless you all in the name of Jesus. Amen.